Good afternoon, good morning. Welcome everyone to this week's Rabbi Sachs lecture. It's a great honor to have with us this week Mrs. Michal Horowitz, who is a well-acclaimed lecturer and teacher. She has a bachelor's and a master's in science from York University and then Brooklyn College. She's well known for her many classes in the five towns throughout the United States and throughout the world. She's a featured speaker for both Yeshiva University recently at their Shvuot program and for the OU. And we at Mizrahi are honored to have her as one of our writers in our weekly Parsha package. Thank you very much to Mrs. Horowitz for the lecture. I'm sure we'll all enjoy it greatly and looking forward to continue learning together. I'll mute myself. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for making me the co-host. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much to uh, Ms. Rachi and to Rabbi Terrigan for inviting me to uh, present this year. Um, I have a relationship with Rabbi Terrigan and Ms. Rachi, and I really appreciate all the opportunities to share Devray Torah. I think we uh, first made acquaintance, besides with Rabbi Terrigan, uh, who my brother from when he was in uh, Eretz Yisrael and Yeshiva from the Five Towns Community Conference pre-COVID that happened annually at the Young Israel Woodmere. It was always an honor and pleasure to speak. Like Rabbi Terrigan said, now I have the uh, weekly parasha and the Mizrahi uh, parasha publication. And now, as with Hashem, this morning, we are going to be speaking about the voice of conscience and the gift of self-knowledge and the thought of Rabbi Sachs. So I'd like to approach a specific um, idea on the thought of Rabbi Sachs. And we are going to begin, actually, I'm going to screen share with you for what I prepared on my screen. Uh, one second. One second, I have to, it's not coming up. Okay, one second. Let me go again. Come back to you. There we go. Okay, can you see that I went to say for Bamid Bar Perikid Bees? Yeah, okay. Okay, good morning. So this week, um, this past parasha in Eretz Yisrael was Parshas Baloscha. This coming week in Chutz Arts is Parshas Baloscha. So we are between two Parshio Baloscha, between uh, Eretz Yisrael and Chutz Arts. So I would like to look at a passage with you in Parshas Baloscha, which will be the point of departure for this morning's shir. In Sefer Bo Midbar and Parak Yudbeis, right at the end of Parshas Baloscha, we are told about the specific sin of Miriam, uh, Miriam and Aaron, like you could see on my screen. But to the Miriam spoke to Aaron about Moshe over the news of the Kushis woman that he took, that she took a Kushis woman. Now, we're not going to be discussing any of the parameters of the sin specifically. What I want to get to is the punishment that happens to Miriam. So Rashi has his pshat and Mephorshim have their pshat. In some degree and in some way, Miriam spoke to Aaron about their brother Moshe. And they said, Did Hashem only speak to Moshe? Hello. Didn't he speak to us? We didn't separate from our spouses just because we are also Navim. Why did Moshe separate from his wife just because he's a Navi? And Hashem heard, The Torah tells us Moshe's reaction. That Moshe is the most humble man who ever walked the face of the earth. And Hashem appeared suddenly to Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. Come out the three of you to the tent of meeting, and the three of them go out. And Hashem descends in a cloud at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and he calls Aaron and Miriam, and the two of them are called out. And he says, listen to my words. But with most Nevi'im, Hashem does not have a direct conversation. It is some sort of vision that he makes himself known. It is some sort of dream. But not so with my servant Moshe. He is the most faithful in my whole house. I don't speak to Moshe. I speak to other Nevi'im. I speak to him mouth to mouth. I speak to him with a clear vision. It's not in riddles. He sees whatever that exactly means. We don't understand an image of God. Why are you not afraid? to speak about my servant, to speak about Moshe. Hashem became angry and he went. And behold, the cloud lifted from upon the tent of meeting and behold, Miriam was stricken with Tzara'a. She had Tzara'a's white like snow. And Aaron turns to look at his sister. And behold, she has Tzara'a's. And Aaron says to Moshe, please, my master, don't let the sin accumulate for us. The problem here is that Aaron can't treat Miriam because he's a first degree 
degree relative. There's no one else who could treat her since the coin is the one who treats Taras. So how are we going to heal our sister? If the coin does not treat the spiritual malady, then she's going to be ever afflicted with Taras. So Mo Aaron asked Moshe to daven for her. Moshe davens for her, the shortest fila that he uttered, says the Gemara, the shortest fila. So Kali so shouldn't say when his sister's in Sar, he is marich bit fila, but for us he davens short. And Hashem says she has to be enclosed outside of the camp. She has to go sit in a chayim for seven days and the people will wait for her. Amir was enclosed outside of the camp for seven days and the people did not move until she was healed. Just like she waited for Moshe on the banks of the Nile River, Mida, Kenega, and Mida, but people waited for her. But the point is that she is stricken with Saras, she must be outside of the camp for seven days. Everyone clearly knows about this and the people are waiting for her. Okay, again, this is Parshas Baloscha. It was just read yesterday in Eretz Yisrael. It will be read this coming week in Chutz Aretz. Okay, how important is this sin of Miriam to remember that she was stricken with Sarah? So if we look here on the screen, you see I went to say for Devarim, Parak Chav Dalet, and the Pasuk tells you in Devarim Chav Dalet, Pasuk Ches, He Shamar B'negat Tzaras Lishmor Ma'od V'lasos. You have to be very careful when it comes to the affliction of Tzaras, be very on guard to do, K'chol Asher Yoru Eschem HaKohanim Alevim, that every Think the Kohanim from the tribe of Levi teach you kasher tzivisim tishmu lazos. So the person who treats saras is not the medical doctor. It is rather the Kohen. And immediately after the Pasuk and Devarim tells you to be very careful with Negat Saras and do whatever the Kohanim tell you, the next, very next Pasuk, Devarim Chof Dalad Pasuk test tells you, Zechar is Asher Asasha Makechel Miriam. Remember what Hashem your God did to Miriam, but Darach Betseis Chem Mitzrayim on the way when you were coming out of Egypt. So what do we have to remember? And this is one of the Sheish Zechiros, the six concert remembrance. So if you look at Rashi, Rashi says, Zechar Sasher Asasha Makechel Miriam, Imbasali Zahir, Shkolo Tila if you want to be very careful not to be stricken with saras, like the previous Pasuk tells you, so then do not speak Lashon Hara, what should you do to prevent yourself from speaking Lashon Hara? Slander of speech, the Har Hasui, the Miriam, she remember what Hashem did to Miriam, she dibber ba'achia, she spoke against her brother, Veloksa bin Agaim, and she was afflicted, afflicted, she was stricken with the plague of saras. Okay, so this is, we see that we have uh, this, this narrative in Parshas Baloscha about what happened to Miriam, as a result of her lashing her, whatever exactly she said, whatever exactly the sin was, but Maya says she was stricken with Saras. We are told that her incident is so important. Imamish have a mitzvah ase de oraisa, according to the Ramban. If you look at the Ramban there, it's a mitzvah ase de oraisa to remember what happened to Miriam. He counts it as one of the Taryag mitzvahs, the Ramban, to remember what happened to her. If you don't want to be stricken with Saras, remember what happened to Miriam. One more source we are going to look at, and then we are going into the thought of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Okay. Now we are in Sefer by Yifka Parakid Gimbal, Parshas Tazria. Parshas Tazria and Sora overwhelmingly are about Negat Saras. Okay, so once you determine that somebody has Saras, you could see here, Ish Saruahu, he is a man who is afflicted. Tamehu, he is impure. Tamei, Tamenu, a coin, Biroshonigo. The coin declares him impure. Again, the coin is the one who treats Saras, which is why Aaron says, How's Miriam ever going to be healed? You don't go to a doctor for Saras, you go to the priest. But if Miriam has no one to heal her, because I, her brother, and a first degree relative, I am not allowed to treat her. There's no other Kohanim here who are not related to her. So you, Moshe, have to daven for her. The coin declares he is impure. His affliction is upon his head. What happens to him? But the man with Saras, the person I should say with Saras, that he has the affliction, God of you he has to tear Kriya. His head must be unshorn. As you could see here, he grows his mustache over his lip. He calls out about himself. He's like an other, says Rashi. And Rashi says, He lets everybody know he is impure. He has to stand at the crossroads. He has tears Kriya. His hair is unshorn. He grows his mustache. Tame, Tame, he calls all about himself, impure, impure, call you Meashar and Negobo. You Tame, Tame, who all the days that he has the affliction of Tsaras, he is impure, Badad ye shave. Now, this is what we see happens to Miriam. He must sit in isolation. Mikutz, Mikutz, Amach, and Moshevo outside of the camp is his dwelling place. Rashi says, Badad ye shave. Shalil you to me, Yoshevim Emo. He is so impure. He's such a bad guy that other people who have Tuma cannot sit with him. But Amru Rabbisin is so, in other words, he can't sit with people who are Zav or Zava or Tami the Mace. He can't say with any of those people. The Amr Rabbi say no manish don mishart meim leishe badad. So the rabbi say, why does he have to be in total isolation? We saw that Miriam has to sit outside the camp for seven days. Total isolation, solitary confinement. Why? 
Because he caused a divide, a slanderous speech between man and wife, and between man and friend, he is to be separated from everybody. So it's mida konega mida. You separated people from each other, man and wife, friend and friend. You have to be separated from society. He has to go to all three camps. In fact, in the beginning of this week's parasha in Chutzar, it's parasha's Naso and Parakei, the Torah delineates that people with different degrees of Tumah go outside of different camps. So some have to go outside of Machana Shechina only. Some have to go Machana Shechina and Levia. Some, like the Metzora, have to go to Machana Shechina, Levia, and Yeshua because nobody wants anything to do with them. And this is exactly what happened to Miriam. The Torah outlines these halachos in Tazria and then Metzora is the healing process. The Torah gives us a very unfortunate example in Miriam Hanavia. And then in Sefer Devarim, the Torah tells us it's Mamish according to the Ramban commentary to Devarim 24.9. It's a mitzvah asay de oraisa to remember what happened to Miriam. And we already saw Rashi, but you don't want to be stricken with Taras. Remember what happened to Miriam. We now go to, that is our introduction. We now go to the thought of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Excuse me, I said a bracha before. Before I unmuted and started. <clears throat> Rabbi Sachs distinguishes between guilt culture and shame culture. What is Knesset Yisrael? Are we, what is Am Yisrael? What is the Torah viewpoint? Are we a shame culture or a guilt culture? And what is the difference? It is one of the themes of his thought, of his work, of his philosophy on life and approach to Torah. And he begins as follows. On December 20th, 2013, this is a very famous story, a young woman named Justine Sackle was waiting in Heathrow Airport before boarding a flight to Africa. 2013, so this is like uh, almost 10 years ago. To while away the time, she sent a tweet of questionable taste about the hazards of catching AIDS in Africa. There was no immediate response. She boarded the plane, unaware of the storm that was about to break out. 11 hours later, upon landing in Africa, she discovered she had become an international name and not in a positive sense. Her tweet and responses to her tweet had gone viral. Over the next 11 days, she would be Googled more than 1 million times. She was branded a racist. She was fired from her job overnight. She had become a pariah because of one tweet that she made about the possibility of catching AIDS, a higher degree of catching AIDS in Africa. The new social media phenomena, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, has brought about a return to an ancient phenomenon, which is public shaming. Um, we just spent, uh, Rabbi uh, Tarragon mentioned that we just spent Shavuos at the YU Shavuos Ritz Yarchikala. Um, Baruch Hashem. And uh, we heard Rabbi Dr. J.J. Sachter speak, and one of the topics that he spoke about over the Yom Tov was Kavar Brios. Okay, based on the second half of the Luchos, Kavar Brios. And this idea that he specifically related it to this time that in which we live, where with social media and public shaming, there is a total lack of Kavar Brios, respect for the dignity of our fellow human being. We totally fail to see the Tzalem Elohim, the spirit of God and the image of God in each and every person. And so we can totally cancel the image of another person, the personality of another person, the life of another person through this idea of public shaming. In fact, in his source, Rabbi Dr. J.J. Schechter quoted from Sichus Maser from Rav Chaim Shmolavet Zatzal from the Mir. The Torah tells us that by Bilam, okay, in the book of Amidbar, so we're going to be the story of Bilam. Bilam had us a donkey, and the donkey talks back to Bilam. Bilam is hired by Balak. He's going to curse the Jews. This is in Parshas Balak, which is coming in a few Parshas. He's going to curse the Jews. And along the way, the donkey talks back to Bilam. Bilam is trying to go where he wants to go. The donkey's not going on the right path. He's pushing his legs into the walls. Bilam is very embarrassed in front of the prominent officers of Moab who came to get him because the donkey's talking back to him. What does Hashem do to the donkey? He kills the donkey. Why does Hashem kill the donkey? Because Rashi and the sages say, Hashem had mercy, compassion on the covered for human beings. Hashem doesn't want Bilam to be embarrassed. Every time someone would see that donkey, they would say, that's the donkey, not embarrass Bilam. 
Do we care about Bilam Harasha? His last name is Raja. Bilam, who is coming to curse the Jews. Bilam, who has nothing positive to say, and only when he says positive, it's because Hashem gives him a nevuah. Bilam, who has the worst of intentions. Bilam, who advised Balak to have the Bnei Yisrael engaged in lewd, illicit, and appropriate activities at Baal Pa'or to bring down Knesset Israel. Do we care about the covet of Bilam Harasha? Rav Chaim Shmulevit says, V'chaim mitzinu b'bilam. As soon as the donkey rebuked Bilam, Mesa, the donkey died. Shalo Yomru, Zaha Ish, Shasalka, as Bilam Betochacha, so that nobody should say, Oh, that is the man who was embarrassed. That's the donkey that embarrassed Bilam. Bilam had nothing to say back. Hashem had mercy over, over the human being, over the dignity of a human being. And then Rav Chaim Shmulevitz Atzal says, Bilam haya avi avos kol ha pechiso sheba'olam. Bilam was the worst degenerate in the whole entire world. He was lacking any human dignity for anybody else. He hated Knesset Shah. He was coming to curse them. He wanted all the gold and silver. He had no respect for anyone. He was the avi avos hatuma. He was the epitome of what is wrong with people in this world. He was so debased. However, there was a worry, there was a doubt, there was a chashash that he could be embarrassed. Hashem was worried about Bilam. Bilam? Bilam the Rasha? And yet Hashem put the donkey to death. Had the donkey lived? Would have been a tremendous Kiddush Hashem. Anyone who would see this donkey would say, wow, that's the donkey. Hashem made such a miracle. That's the donkey that spoke. It was a Hollywood movie. A number of years ago, a picture movie, the Havdal, excuse me, Alpha Alpha of Dals, where there was a talking, a very famous talking donkey. Could you imagine if there was a real life famous talking donkey, not the Shrek one, a real donkey? It was created by Shesher Shmi Baratius. It would have been such a Kiddush Hashem. It would have been Gavaldic. But wait, Bila might be insulted. Bilam the Avi Avo Satuma might be insulted. Mikol Malcolm, Kevan Shayesh, Behisha Rosa, Behaim Pgia Kala. However, if it would have stayed alive, there would have been a little bit embarrassment to the cover of Bilam Arasha, Chasam Makam al Kvodo, the Hemi Sasa Asa. Hashem put him to death so that no one should be, the Bilam should not be embarrassed. Says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Think about this as we publicly joke at other people's expense post comments that are negative, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the new social media have brought about a return to an ancient phenomenon, public shaming. Two recent books, he says, John, Ro Ro John Ronson, so you've been publicly shamed, I did not read either of these books, and Jennifer Jacquette's A Shame Necessary have discussed this idea. Jennifer Jacquette, A Shame Necessary, believes public shaming is a good thing. It can be a, a way of getting public corporations to behave more responsibly, for example. On the other hand, Ronson highlights the dangers. It is one thing to be shamed by a community that you are a part of. It is quite another to be shamed by a global network of strangers who know nothing about you or the context in which your act or words took place. This is more like a lynch mob than the pursuit of justice. And it's very interesting when we talk about the sin of Miriam, none of us were actually there. This is something that happened millennia and thousands of years ago. And yet the Torah seems to go out of the way to publicly shame the person who has saras, which is exactly where Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs is going to be good. And why we began in Parshas Balozcha, which was yesterday's Parsha in Eretz Yisrael, and this coming week's Parsha in Chutzart. It seems that the Torah is publicly shaming the person who has saras. In fact, Miriam's sin is recorded for posterity. We did not know Miriam. We did not know the context in which it occurred. Even if our neshama stood at Har Sinai, this is no longer at Har Sinai. It is a narrative of the Torah recorded forever, according to the Ramban, a mitzvah asi de oraisa of the Tariyag mitzvahs, to remember what happened to Miriam, to speak about it. He says, Ramban, Zachar Bapeh, you should speak about what happened. Isn't it Lashon Har to speak about what happened to Miriam? Isn't that public shaming? The answer, as you will see, is actually yes, it is public shaming. Either way, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, whether you agree that public shaming is good, like Jennifer Jacquet, or whether you agree that it is not good, I think most of us would probably go with the latter view. None of us would, God forbid, want to be publicly shamed by a global network of strangers who know nothing about you or the context in which your words were made. It gives us an understanding of the otherwise bewildering phenomenon of sara'at, the condition dealt with at length in the Torah, in Tazria, and Mitzorah, and also in Baaloscha, and also like we saw in Devarim. 
it has been variously translated as leprosy, skin disease, scaly infection. And if you notice, I did not translate Saras. The reason I personally never ever translate Saras into English is because it is not a medical condition like Rabbi Sachs is about to point out. Saras is, in my own translation, for those who learn with me, I hope you remember, we say this every year, it is a spiritual malady with a physical manifestation. Saras is a spiritual illness with physical manifestation. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs is going on to prove to you that Saras is not a physical condition. Yet there are four formidable problems in identifying Saras, says Rabbi Sachs, with any known medical disease. First of all, the symptoms do not correspond to the disease of leprosy. Second, as described in the Torah, it affects not only a human being's body, it also affects the walls of their home, it can affect the furniture of their home, and it could affect their clothing. There is no known medical condition that has this property, says Rabbi Sachs. That's why it's treated by the Kohen. It's not treated by a doctor. The rapo yirape says the pasuk of mishpatim. So the Gemara says, "Mikan yesh rishus the rapo the rape." Because the Torah says, "Heal he shall surely heal." So the Gemara says the Torah gives a doctor permission to heal. So if someone has a medical condition, you go to the doctor. You don't go to the rabbi. You might go to the rabbi for a bracha to ask him to daven for you. But you better go to the doctor. That's normally established. If a person has saras, they do not seek out the attention of a physician, which is exactly why Aaron said to Moshe, "There's no one to daven for." I can't heal her because I'm her relative. She doesn't need a doctor. The only thing that might save her is your tefillos. So Rabbi Sachs has proven that this is not a physical condition. Besides, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the Torah is a book about holiness, kedusha, and correct conduct. It is not a medical text. Even if it were, the procedure to be carried out for the Mitzorah do not correspond to anything if Tsaras was a contagious disease. So he says if it was a contagious disease, the procedure carried out on the Torah does not follow the pattern of what we would do if it was a contagious disease. Furthermore, Tsaras is described in the Torah does not bring about sickness. We're not told the person lays in his bed. We're not told that he has fever. We're not told he has boils. We're not told he's throwing up. We're not told he's weak. He's perfectly fine. In fact, he has to stand at the crossroads like we already saw in Vayikra Perikad Gimel. Tamei, tamei yikra, mashmiya acheri, mishohu tamei v'yafrishu mimenu. He lets other people know that he is impure and they have to stay away from him. Clearly, he is not medically, physically ill. Says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, quote, health and purity are different things altogether. The sages decoded the missile, what is Tsaras? It's not medical. It, a medical disease does not affect your furniture or the walls of your house or your clothing. A medical disease means a person gets physically sick. This guy is not physically sick. He has a physical manifestation of a spiritual illness. The sages decoded the mystery of Tsaras by telling us about a case in Torah in which someone was afflicted by Tsaras. Quote, says Rabbi Sachs, one happened when Miriam spoke about her brother Moshe. So this day was picked a little while ago. Uh, we had some conflicts and had to switch the date. And I saw that this was the date that I would be speaking. And it's between Parshas Balosha and Eretz Yisrael and Chutz Aris. It's such a beautiful opportunity to delve into this idea of shame and guilt and the thought of Lord Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. One instance of Tsaras, he says, happened when Miriam spoke against her brother Moshe, as we already saw when we began this year. Another occurred when Moshe at the burning bush, this goes back to Sefer Shmos, Parsha Shmos, when Moshe said about the Bnei Yisho, right in the beginning of Parag Dalet, came lo yaminu li v'lo yishmu b'koli, ki yamru lo nirach elach Hashem, Parag Dalet, Pesach Alpha Shmos, Hashem says, go free the Jews, and Moshe, interestingly, the brother of the one who spoke about him later, she was afflicted with Saras. What happens to Moshe when he speaks Saras about Knesset Israel? Shem says, put your hand in your bosom, take it out. Moshe also was stricken and afflicted with Saras. So therefore, says Rabbi Laura Jonathan Sachs, and he's quoting the Gemara in Erechin, the sages regard Saras as a punishment for Lashon Har, evil speech, speaking negatively or denigrating another person. In fact, as part of the rehabilitation process of the Mitzorah, Perak Yudalit of Vayikra, he is told he is to bring two live birds that chirp. Why does the Torah make a point of saying that the Mitzorah brings as part of its purification chirping, tweeting birds? Rashi says there, I'm not going to take the time to show it to you on the screen, even though I prepared it on the screen, but Rashi says there, he did an act of verbal twittering. It's just amazing to see Pitpute Dvarim Rashi a thousand years ago predicts what the act of verbal twittering will be. He did an act of verbal twittering with Lashon Hara, let him bring birds that chirp to remind him that his sin was because of this verbal twittering. What 
what Rashi would say today about the instances and the idea of public shaming and not seeing the cover of Salam Elohim and other people when we are constantly twittering news about other people. This helped the sages explain, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, why the symptoms of tsaras, mold, discoloration, could affect walls, furniture, clothing, human skin. Why? Says Rabbi Sachs, they were a series of warnings or punishments. It's a series of warnings. First, the offender is warned by sending a sign of decay to the walls of his house. If he does not get the message and the offender repeated the offense, then he is afflicted on his clothing. If he still does not get the message and the offender repeated the offense, he is then afflict, afflicted on his very own self. So what you see is that Hashem brings the punishment in stages, or as Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs says, a series of warnings or punishments. First, the warning is totally external. That's either on the walls of the home or the furniture. This is totally external to me. This does not affect my body in any way, shape, or form. External. If the person does not get, if he gets the message, it goes away and he's treated and they treat the walls of the home, they cut out the bricks, they take him outside the camp, finish, puts a new plaster, done. If you don't get the warning and you don't get the message, it now goes onto your clothing. Now the concentric circles are moving a little bit closer. Now it's on the clothing. And it's interesting to consider, consider that begad clothing is from the word bogade, traitor or treason. Okay, goes all the way back to my Sabratius and Adam and Isha's sin when they first got clothing. Clothing only became necessary after Adam and Isha ate from the Eitzadas, the forbidden fruit. They committed a trespass or a treason against the Rebbe Olam. Because of that trespass, Bogei, it was ne necessary to give them Bigadim. I, uh, I first became aware of this idea from Rav Avram Yitzchak Cohen Cook. Thoughts on the parsha? It's not my own idea, but Shavashim and Lashon Kodesh are very significant. So first, it's totally external. It's in the widest concentric circle. It will affect the walls of your home or your furniture. You don't get the message. You keep speaking Lashon Now you're a traitor. Further, bogade. It will affect your bigadim. That's much closer to you, but it's still not you yourself. You don't get the message. Now it's going to move into your skin itself. How are we to understand this, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs? Why was evil speech, Lashon Hara, regarded as such a serious offense that it took these strange phenomenon, which we cannot identify medically what it is, to point to its existence? And why was it punished in this way and not another way? Again, Public shaming. It seems clear that the Mitzorah is publicly shamed. Moshe's sin of speaking Lashon Har in the beginning of Perak Dal and Shemos goes down for posterity. Miriam's sin goes down forever, so much so that it's a mitzvah ase de oraisa to remember it in your mouth all the time. It's one of the shesh the heroes. <laughs> Isn't it Lashon Har to be speaking about Miriam's sin of Lashon Har? And is Judaism a culture of, is Judaism a culture of shame? It was the anthropologist Ruth Benedict in her book about Japanese culture who popularized a distinction. And here we go to the crux of the thought of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. The title of today's shir is The Voice of Conscience and the Gift of Self-Knowledge. It was the anthropologist Ruth Benedict in her book about Japanese culture, the chrysanthemum and the sword, who popularized a distinction between two kinds of society, guilt culture, and shame culture. Ancient Greece, like Japan, was a shame culture. We need to keep this distinction separate. Other religions are shame cultures. Judaism and religions influenced by it, he says, are guilt cultures. What is the difference between a shame culture, which is religions outside of Judaism, and guilt culture? Are they two different things? Are we meant to derive a different lesson from a shame culture and a guilt culture? And how does the Torah view the guilt culture and what does it mean to teach us? It's a very, very powerful approach of Rabbi Sachs to understanding how we should feel in the aftermath of sin and the aftermath of immorality and our approach to repentance. If we are a guilt culture, what does God demand of us once we have done a mistake? once we have sinned a sin. In shame cultures, listen very, very, very carefully. What matters is the judgment of others. Judaism is not a shame culture. In shame cultures, what matters is the judgment of others. Acting morally in shame cultures means, quote, conforming to public rules, rules 
and expectations. You do what other people expect you to do. In my own words, you must be politically correct, even if it is not morally correct. I will say it again. Shame culture means conforming to society. You do what other people expect you to do. Quote, says Rabbi Sachs, you follow society's conventions. In Michal Haritz's words, you are politically correct in shame cultures, even if that political correctness is not morally correct. If you fail to conform in shame cultures, which is the society in which we live, society punishes you by subjecting you to shame, subjecting you to ridicule, disapproval, humiliation, and ostracism, which is exactly what the proliferation of social media, Twitter and Facebook and WhatsApp, where messages go around the world in literally, literally seconds, seconds. And someone doesn't toe the line when you step outside of what society demands of you, you are subjected to shame, shame culture, ridicule, public humiliation, disapproval, and ultimately ostracism. It's what we call the cancel culture. However, in guilt cultures, which is what Judaism is. What matters is not what people think. It is the voice of what your conscience tells you. When I stand on the high holidays, Asham nu bagad nu gazal nu dibar nu dofi, Asham nu we are guilty, gazal nu we have stolen, Asham nu bagad nu, going back to Bogade, by the way, okay? Uh, what we just mentioned about the Shorosh about Begad, Bogade, Asham nu bagad nu, we have committed treason, Saras affects the clothing as a sign of the treason, Gazal nu dibar nu dofi, we have stolen, we have spoken slander. It's about me, it's about what I did. I strike my heart because I'm looking inwards. I have acted immorally, irrespective of what society says. I have done the wrong thing. I sinned. In guilt cultures, it matters not what other people think of you, but the voice of what your conscience tells you. Living morally in a guilt culture means acting in accordance with internalized moral imperatives. You shall and you shall not. And in fact, the whole Torah is built upon asin velavin. You shall do zachar semashavas akacho. You shall not do lo saviru esh b'chamash vasecha b'yabashavas. You shall go, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You shall not light a kindle. You shall not kindle a fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath. The whole Torah is founded upon asin, ase, you shall do. Lavin, lo tashe, you shall not do. What matters is in guilt cultures, what you know according to the law, and here we call it the law, the law book, what is right and what is wrong. And therefore people in a shame culture, says Rabbi Sachs, and this, and I'm not talking about our society in terms of Yehadus, but this is true of the society in which we find ourselves living today, the world at large, the global society. People in shame cultures are other directed. They care about how they appear in the eyes of others. Or as we would say today, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, they care about their image. You could say that they care about their status. You could care about how many friends you have on the wall, how many times your tweet was retweeted. You care about your status and your likes. People in shame cultures are outer directed. People in guilt cultures are inner directed. They care about what they know about themselves in moments of absolute honesty. It's not whether someone else says I'm right or wrong. It's whether I've fulfilled the word, of God, the word of God and I have done right by the mitzvah or God forbid wrong by the mitzvah. A guilt culture individual cares about what they know about themselves in moments of absolute honesty. I'm going to interrupt Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs for one moment to interrupt him to bring you the words of another very great thinker, scholar and Talmud Chacham Rabbi Joseph B. Salvechik the Rav. When one says vidui, vidui is an act of confession. Confession for what? Sin. Who confesses? Those in a guilt culture, to paraphrase Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Asham nu, bagad nu. You strike your heart to show that the error was internal, inside. It's not that I didn't conform to society. It's that I did not conform to the Torah law. When a person says vidui, says Rabbi Salvech, a confession, there's another aspect. Quote, a person cannot rationalize himself when he says vidui. He cannot say, I sin, 
that you know, Rabbanu Sha'olam, it was hard. I had worries about finances. I had sorrows. And the Yates are horror. The evil inclination is strong. And I am weak. So I sinned. We cannot look for mitigating or extenuating circumstances. If a Jew wants to be malamed tzchus upon himself when he says vidui, if he wants to give himself the benefit of the doubt, exonerate his sins, excuse his sins, as he's saying confession, then it's not a confession, it's a rationalization. It's worthless. Vidui is an accusation. Confession is accusation. The person has to have great strength to accuse himself. And this is one of the greatest of challenges. Says of Salvechit, you can't smooth yourself out when you stand before God. Stand as you are. No chachmas, no tricks, no wisdom. Present yourself as you are before God. That's guilt culture. The realization that I internally have sinned. Irrespective of what society says, because we look around the world today, not everything society says is morally correct. Far, far from it. Shame culture worries about conforming because what will other people say? Guilt culture worries about what will I say about myself? And even more, what will the Almighty have to say about me? People in shame cultures are other directed. People in guilt cultures are inner directed. Shame is public humiliation. Guilt is inner torment. Says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, shame, living in a shame culture, the cancel culture is public humiliation. That's not the Torah way. The Torah way is harata al ha'avar, regret for the past. Guilt is inner torment. I am embarrassed before God because morally I did not behave properly. I'm embarrassed before God because ethically I did not do the right thing. The emergence of a guilt culture in Judaism flowered from its understanding of the relationship between God and mankind. Guilt culture is based on the relationship between the Borei Olam, the creator of the world, and every single human being. In Judaism, we are not actors on a stage where society is the audience or the judge. In shame cultures, we are actors on a stage where society is the judge of everything we do, Everything we say, everything we post, everything we type. Attorney Brafman, Benjamin Brafman, the well-known, well-famous attorney, I actually cut it out. It was in the paper a number of years ago, an interview with him, and I hung it over my desk. He says, if you don't want it repeated or reposted, don't type it. Quote, you can take your computer, smash it, and throw it in the ocean, and we can still retrieve what you posted. In a shame culture, society is the audience and the judge. In a guilt culture, I myself and God himself are the audience and judge. Because as Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, we can fool society, but we cannot fool God. All pretense and pride, every mask and persona, the cosmetic cultivation of a public image are irrelevant before God, which is exactly what the Rav says when you come to say, Rabbi Joseph B. Salvechik, when you come to say, Vidui, just stand as God before you are. You can't be Malamed Tzchus upon yourself while you're confessing. You can't give God all the excuses of why you sinned. You sinned. That's it. I failed. I sinned. You clap and I'll hate. It's your heart. It's your internality. It doesn't matter what the world says. What matters is that you did not fulfill the Asr. You were over the low Tassin. He quotes a Pasuk, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs from Sefer Shmuel Perak Aleph. Man sees the external persona, but God sees the heart. Shame cultures are collective and conformist. Woe unto the person who today does not agree, who is not politically correct, who dares to stand up with an ethical, moral voice. Woe unto he. He will be canceled because shame cultures are collective and conformist. You have to agree. You have to toe the line or your life will be ruined. By contrast, Judaism, the classic guilt culture, emphasizes the individual and his relationship with the Almighty. What matters is not whether we conform to the culture of age. What matters as a Jew is if we do what is good, what is just, and what is right. Pasuk says in Micha, when I was preparing the shir, it reminds me very much of the Pasuk in Micha, famous, beautiful Pasuk in Micha, Perik Vav Pasuk Ches, Higidacha Adam Matov. 
I will tell you, man, says the prophet, what is good. And what God seeks of you. You shall do justice. You shall love loving kindness. And you shall walk humbly with the Lord your God. Which brings us all the way back to the beginning of our Shia. The point of the parsha for us here was Parsha's Baha Aloscha. Yesterday's Parsha in Eretz Yisrael and this coming week's Parsha in Chutzlarts. How are we understand? How are we to understand that it seems to be that the punishment for the Matsura is public shaming? <clears throat> this makes the law of Tsaras, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, fascinating. Because according to the interpretation of the sages, Quote, it constitutes one of the rare instances in the Torah of punishment by shame rather than punishment by guilt. So if you were thinking after everything we have learned so far, that it seems like Taras is part of a shame culture, you are right. It is part of a shame culture. It's the Yotze in a cloud from the Torah. But Darach cloud. The general rule is that Judaism is a guilt culture. We have explored it. We have explained it. It's between me and God. It doesn't matter what society says. It's not that I have to conform to society. It's that I have to listen to the law of Torah. It's not that I have to be politically correct. It needs to, I need to be godly correct. It doesn't matter what they think of me. It matters what God thinks of me and what I know to be true about myself. That's guilt culture. That's healthy. That's harata al abar. That is used as impetus for change and improvement. But Miriam was publicly humiliated. Moshe was publicly humiliated. These sins go down forever. Torah is eternal. And Yemosa Mashiach, it will still be there, the Chamisha Chum Torah. It's one of the mitzvahs Tamidios, the six Zechiros, according to the Ramban, it's a Del Raisa, to remember Bapa, everything that Miriam did. It's a shame culture. So Ra'as is one of the rare instances when the Torah punishes by shame rather than guilt. The appearance of tsaras on the walls of the house is a public sign of a private wrongdoing. You spoke last night, in private, you watched in front, and all of a sudden, everybody who walks by your house sees, oh my God, his walls are green, his walls are red, his walls are white, his walls are sunken in. Ha ha, he spoke last night. It was a way of saying to everyone who lived or visited there, quote, says Rabbi Sachs, bad things have been said in this place. Little by little, the signal came closer to the culprit. Then it appears on the bed or the chair. Then it appears on his clothes. We already explained Bogade, Begadim. Then ultimately, it appears on his skin until eventually he is diagnosed as defiled. And now he quotes the Psukim from Perak Yud Gimel of Ayikra, Parshish Tezriah, that we began with. I'm not going to put them on the screen again. We began by saying once he is diagnosed as Saras, Tamehu, Tamehu, he is impure, he is impure. What does he have to do? Al Safa Miate, he grows a mustache. He leaves his hair unshorn. He tears Kriya and he stands at the crossroads. So everyone who comes into town is going to hear a voice saying, Tame, Tame, I am impure. I am impure. Badad Yeshev, outside of all three camps, nobody wants you. They don't want you Machna Shriya. They don't want you at Machna Levia. And they don't even want you at Machna Yisra. Says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. These are quintessentials, expressions of shame. First, the stigma, the disgrace or dishonor, torn clothing, unkempt hair, then the ostracism, temporary exclusion from affairs of society. These have nothing to do with medical illness and everything to do with social disapproval. This is what makes the law of Saras so hard to understand at face value. It's a rare appearance of public shame in a non-shame-based guilt culture. It's the yotzim in the cloud. It's when God says, you know what? We're not going to be a guilt culture when it comes to dealing with the metzora. When it comes to dressing Miriam's sin, we're going to be a shame culture. It has nothing to do, however, with society and their imposition of shame upon the person. And here is where it dis it's distinguished from the shame culture of society. It's because God has signaled that this is what shall be done. So when there's an exception to our guilt culture of Judaism, and we have the application of shame culture, it's not because society decided. It's not because some politicians decided that this is what's right. It's not some group of elite at some university decided this is what we should all do. And woe unto you dares to speak out. 
It's because God said, in this instance, we will use the shame culture. I specifically, in the case of Russian horror, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, because speech is what holds society together. What sustains cooperation amongst human beings is trust. And trusting each other allows us and encourages us to make sacrifices for the group, knowing others will do likewise. That is precisely why Russian horror is so destructive. It undermines trust in fellow human beings. It makes people suspicious about one another. It weakens the bond that holds society together. If unchecked, listen carefully and think God for a bit of any situations you may have been in in your life where this is relevant. Lashon Hara will destroy any group it attacks. It will destroy a family, a team, a community. It will even destroy a nation. Kmar famously tells us in Yuma, Tess, on the base, first temple was destroyed because of three cardinal sins, idolatry, promiscuity, adultery, and blurt murder, bloodshed. And tells us that the second temple was destroyed because of basis hatred. But then the Gemara says something there that's less unknown. And in the time of the first temple, there wasn't any basis hatred. The Gemara answers, The Gemara answers that in the time of the first temple period, you had people who would eat and drink, socialize, pretend to be friends with one another, and they would spear one another with the swords of their tongue. Lashon Hara will destroy any group it attacks, says Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, a family, a team, a community, even a nation. The power of language to weaken the very thing that language was brought to create. Language is meant to make us into a cohesive whole. Language is meant to make us into a community. Language is meant to build families. Language is meant to establish bonds of trust. The same language now undermines and destroys all of that. And that's why the punishment for Lashon Hara is temper the punishment for the person for Lashon Hara is that he is temporarily excluded from society. There is public exposure, stigmatization and shame and ostracism. It is difficult, if not impossible, to punish the gossiper using the normal convention of law. This cannot be done with Lashon Hara because Lashon Hara is subtle. There are many ways of harming a person's reputation through speech. Someone accused of Lashon Hara can easily say, I didn't say it. Although today it's harder to say you didn't say it with social media. I didn't mean it. And even if I did, I did not say anything untrue. Lashon Hara is true words. The best way of dealing with people who poison relationships is by naming, shaming, and shunning them. And miraculously, according to the sages, that is what Sarah did in ancient times. Today, it no longer exists in the form described by Torah. But, quote, the use of internet and social media, I'm quoting Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the use of internet and social media as instruments of public shaming illustrate the power and the danger of a culture of shame. We must distinguish, however, I'm going to reiterate it, even though I said it again. The society in we live is a shame culture decided by the intellectuals, the thinkers, the politicians, the influencers, social media. The exception to the rule of guilt culture, which is brought down in the Torah, is not society directed, it's commanded by God. It works in this situation because God said to punish this person who broke all bonds of trust between man and fellow man, between man and wife, between society, community, kehila, schools, shows. We will shame him. But it's not because society dictated that that's what we must do. It's because God dictated that that's what we must do in this case. So is it public shaming? Yes. Is it a mitzvah asay de arise according to the Ramban to remember what happened to Miriam and to speak about it? But Peg, go look up the Ramban. I wanted to screen share with you, but I don't have time. Yes. Is it because society said we shall shame this person? No. It's because in this unique case, because Saras is, because Lashonar is akin to murder, the Gemara says. This person must be publicly shamed. He destroyed the bonds that create society. We will publicly shame him and remove him to the, from the society. He undermined. Only rarely does the Torah invoke public shaming. 
And in the case of the Mitzora, it is by an act of God, not society. Yet the moral of the Mitzora remains. Malicious gossip, Lashon Hara, undermines relationships, erodes social bonds, and damages trust. And therefore God says it deserves to be exposed and it deserves to be shamed. Last line of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, never speak ill of others. And the Torah warns you to stay far, far away from those who do. So as we are here poised on this Yom Rishon the Shavua between Parshas Baloscha and Eretz Yisrael last week, and Parshas Baloscha this coming week, in Chutzar, so we have a lot to think about based on the thought of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Zichon Olavracha. In general, Judaism is a guilt culture, and guilt is positive, guilt is healthy. Guilt is the impetus for change. Guilt means I did something wrong. Don't smooth yourself out as you stand before God, says Rabbi Joseph B. Salvage. Extend as you are. Be aware of your moral failings. The title of today's year is The Voice of Conscience. Listen to your own self and the gift of self-knowledge. Know what your sin was. It's between you and God, and you must determine and act how God wants us to act and how God determines we shall do. The whole Torah is us in the love but there's a rare exception to the rule. And that is in the case of he who speaks Lashon Hara. And then God says, in this instance, he will be publicly shamed because he strove to undermine the bonds that connect man to fellow man. And this instance, most appropriate lesson, a message for posterity is that he who shames and destroys others, ultimately by the word of God, will be shamed and destroyed. Can he repent? Can he be rehabilitated? Of course, that's all Perikadad of Vayikra, and that's Parshas Tzimtzorah. But like Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs says, never speak ill of others and stay far, far away from those who do. I wish everybody a thoughtful day, an uplifting day, a lot of food for thought. And I thank Rabbi Terrigan for including me in his wonderful programs. And I wish you all a Shavua Tov Koto. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michal, and thank you everyone for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Shabbat shalom.